Welcome back to the Mindful Lender Podcast. I'm your host as always, Jay Nickel. And this week, we're going to go into my most recent goat hunt. This is my second uh, solo winter goat hunt this year, my third in total. Um, easily my most successful goat hunt so far, although to be honest, the bar is not very high because I haven't had a lot of great success um, on the first couple you know, kicks at the can. But that being said, it was still good to see progress. I think sometimes we get hung up in, or I get hung up in the fact that if I don't, if I don't kill anything, then the hunt was a failure. And I, I still stand by that, but I think, I think it's good to recognize that there's other successes that should be, you know, taken note of or what, whatever you want to say. Anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll get into, we'll get into all that a little bit of housekeeping first. So spotting scope review, I'm doing my best. I'm really hoping I can get it out next week. So if you're not already a member over at mine for reviews, I'd go join up because I'm going to be raffling off the winning spotting scope and only people who belong to mindful reviews are going to qualify for that mindful reviews.com. I'm giving away a Polar Ignite 3 fitness watch on Mind for Reviews. That's for all lifetime members doing that Saturday morning. So if you catch this podcast in time and you want to be eligible, just go buy a lifetime membership. You're automatically entered into the draw. Um, I think that's it for housekeeping. There's not a whole lot um, to do. I would like to say I came back very energized and very motivated from this hunt. So you can expect a lot more content coming down the pipe. I was doing my best to get out a review per week over the last few weeks before I left on my goat hunt. And I think I'm, I'm going to do my best to keep that momentum up because I think it's good for the channel. I think it's good for the members at Mindful Reviews. And I think it's just in general good for momentum. So I'm going to do what I can to keep that, that pace. Okay, so let's talk about this hunt. So initially, what was supposed to happen was <clears throat> a buddy had reached out and put me in contact with somebody who drew a fairly premium go tag, and they didn't have anybody to go with, and they wanted somebody to go with. To go with, this was somebody I kind of knew through people we'd never met before. Really great guy. He's the kind of guy that always helps people out on hunts. Um, he's been guiding for a long time. He's been. Um, uh, responsible for a ton of dead goats. So I was really excited at the opportunity of going hunting with this guy because I looked at it as a chance for me to learn from somebody who knows more than I do about goat hunting. And then about a week before we were supposed to leave, he calls me and he's like, it's just not going to happen, man. And I get it. Um, you know, life happens sometimes and it's kind of late in the season. He had a bunch of other stuff going on and he just couldn't get away for the amount of time that he needed to get away for to make it happen. So essentially at that point, it was kind of, okay, I guess I'm going back solo hunting. So I've been looking at the area of where I, I would go back if I had the opportunity to go back and I decided, you know, that was the area that I wanted to go to. Now, one of the things I find interesting is that this, this was the first time and I'm going to say over five years, because when I used to blacktail hunt, I would go back to similar spots year after year. Um, but since then, except for a little bit of, you know, spring bear hunting, I go to Landers from time to time, which is more of a fun hunt than anything else. I haven't actually hunted the same location twice. I can't remember the last time that's actually happened. So one of the things I like to do is go somewhere new every time I go hunting. But stop and think about that for a second. It's not a particularly successful strategy for killing animals because part of the benefit you get from going back to a location is that one of the hardest parts about killing an animal is figuring out where they are, patterning them, trying to figure out, you know, their regular routes and where you're most likely to see them, bedding areas, feeding areas, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and if you're never going back to the same areas, you're never taking advantage of that informational edge. And so it's one of the things that I'm going to work on moving forward. I think it's cool to always go to new areas. I really like the challenge of always going to new areas. I definitely get that kind of like hardcore adventure 
style hunt from always going to new areas, but I am kind of hamstringing myself in regards to the level of success that I'm capable of or that I have the potential of, of achieving. So I decided to go back into an area. I'd already been there before. I had a rough idea of like where I was going to camp and all that kind of stuff. So I felt a little more prepared than I, than I normally do. So again, it's a kick-ass drive. So kind of broke it up into, um, a couple parts, did it a little bit differently this time. So instead of driving a little bit of the way one day, like at night or something, and then driving the rest of the way and going to sleep in the area and then waking up and hiking in, I drove the majority of the way the day before I started hunting. So maybe drove 12, 13 hours, stayed at a hotel, and then I woke up at five o'clock in the morning and drove the last three hours and then hiked in in the morning, which I think was a really good strategy and something I'm going to take advantage of moving forward. Because the fact of the matter is you you don't typically um, get that early of a start anyways. Um it's not that you don't get that early of a start, but there's always a little bit of messing around on the first day of a hunt. So I think having that drive the first couple hours in the morning didn't really set me back that much. And it enabled me to almost get a whole day head start. So that's what I did. Now, because I knew where I was going, the last time that I went into this area, it took me two full days to kind of hike where where I wanted to camp, but because I knew where I was going and I had a rough idea what was going on, I was like, I'm pretty sure I can pound this out in one day. So the first day was literally nothing but hiking. Um, one of the benefits was though, I knew where I was going and I'd been there before. So it, there's something about when you don't know the end destination of a hike, it always feels longer than when you do. It's why the hike out always feels so much shorter than the hike in, to be honest with you. So for some additional context, it was also brutally cold on that first day. And the forecast was for extremely cold temperatures, at least for the next few days before it let up a little bit. So we're talking like somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, minus 20, minus 25 at night. Um, And then, you know, minus 15 to minus 20 during the day, like real cold. And one of the learnings from this hunt is that logistically speaking and practically speaking, there is a substantial difference between minus 10 and minus 20. Because the first hunt I did in the year was around minus 10 and minus when, 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 when temperatures are fluctuating between minus five and minus 10, it's really not that bad. Like you can, a lot of this stuff that you're doing doesn't even seem to be that affected. You don't have to wear gloves. Most of the time you can, your clothes, you have a lot more forgiveness, your sleep system. You have a lot more forgiveness water freezes, but as long as you're accessing it on a somewhat regular basis, it doesn't freeze, you know, instantaneously or within an hour. When you start getting down to minus 20 and it starts going to minus 25 at night, it really becomes a substantial obstacle in your hunt. Like you can't keep water in anything. It will freeze in 10 to 20 minutes. Lids freeze on things almost instantaneously. You can almost not wear, you have to be wearing gloves almost at all times. Like it is viciously cold and However, I would like to point out that doesn't mean you can't hunt through it. I feel very encouraged by how well my system held up, which I'll get into in a little bit. I I really didn't change that much significantly from my last hunt. So if you go listen to the gear dump uh, podcast from the first hunt, it was basically the same stuff, except I had a couple, a couple different pieces that I brought in addition to the, to the to what I had on the last hunt. But I knew going in, it was going to be really cold. They just got a big dump of snow and there was more snow and more cold to be expected. So first day I hike all the way in. Now I knew where I wanted to camp. So I got there and I got everything set up, really took my time, made a good camp. 
Um, I've touched on this before, but when you're winter camping in the snow, one of the first things you want to do when you get to your proposed location is stamp out your camping pad. Um, and then hopefully you've got stuff you can go do for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. And then that camping pad will set right up. It'll turn almost into concrete. You'll be able to, as long as there's a little bit of moisture in the snow. That was one of the issues I'd had on the first goat hunt is that the snow was so dry, no matter how much I, I packed it down, you couldn't use tent pegs for the life of you because they were just flipping right out of the snow. Even a snow peg wouldn't have helped significantly. Um, and that is another reason why I stand by for winter camping, you should be using a, a, um, a freestanding tent because you don't even need pegs with a freestanding tent. Uh, it, they help, but they're not necessary in any way, shape or form. So get the camping pad stamped out, kind of start setting everything up. I was in a nice bit of cover. The other thing, there was a lot of avalanche warnings for the area. So when you pick a camping spot, you really want to pay attention to that. So I'm usually looking for like some type of like really thick timber that is out away from the toe of the slope and preferably not in the line of travel of any of the avalanche shoots. Like Lots of times shoots kind of come down and kick to the side. And so if you can camp in the area that's that's off angle from the direction of that shoot, that's ideal. So I picked my camp, got it set up. By then it was pretty late in the day. I did notice there was a significant difference in the length of days between my first hunt and my second hunt. Going hunting in the later part of February compared to hunting in the early part of January, you're probably saving or you're probably gaining. I mean, it's got to be at least an hour and a half to two hours a day uh, compared to earlier in January. So that was, that was really beneficial. So first day gets up and that's really all that happens that first day, hike in, get everything set up and go to bed. Now, one of the things that I noticed was really interesting is that I had next to zero condensation in the tent on that first night. Now, it was very windy. And I thought this was particularly interesting because I think I've taken note of that before on summer hunts, but maybe not as distinctly. It didn't it didn't stand out to me as clearly as it did on this hunt. But with that stiff breeze blowing all night, and it wasn't like a gusty wind where it was beating the hell out of the tent. It was like a nice steady breeze. Um, it kept almost all the condensation out of the tent. So I got a little bit cocky. I was like, oh, I don't know what happened, but I guess I got the system figured out. I'm not going to have any condensation. That was not true. The rest of the hunt, we were right back to that like kind of crazy dripping tent syndrome that you tend to get in the winter that I'll talk about a little bit more later in the podcast. So get through that night. Now, I was also set up fairly close to a river for a reason. You can melt snow for water in the wintertime, but it takes a lot of fuel. Now, while we're talking about fuel, I want to make a note about my camp stove of choice as well. Previously, on winter hunts, I've always used an MSR reactor, which does have an additional pressure valve that enables it to be a slightly more efficient winter stove than most pressurized isobutane canister stoves. So it's going to be better than a jet boil uh, or other kind of cheaper canister stoves, but it's still beholden to the limits of kind of pressurized gas isobutane canister stoves. And what I noticed was my, my fuel or my, my cooking was really only efficient for the first 60% of the canister. So when the canister was really full and it was minus 20, it would still work fairly well. And I could boil water in a reasonable amount of time. However, between the really cold temperatures and as soon as a fuel canister would get like below 40% full, the cook times would just skyrocket. And I would look and 
the the heat would be way down and I would have to like pick the canister up and shake the hell out of it to kind of increase the pressure within the canister. Now I was able to get through that and I used three 230 gram canisters over the course of the week that I was in there. And all three of them are still probably a third full. But by the time they got to that third full point, they were useless. Like it was taking forever to boil. So I made the decision that moving forward, um, I'll be going to like a white gas, like a solid fuel, uh, liquid fuel, um, stove moving forward for these deep winter hunts. Because if you get caught out again in minus 20, minus 25, and if I'd have been staying for any, like even another day or two, things would have gotten, it wouldn't have been the end of the world because as long as you carried the canister in your jacket for a few hours or shook the hell out of it, like you could make it work, but it just wasn't ideal. And it was like, every time you start compromising the efficiency of some element of your system, you're just getting that much closer to something really bad happening. So anyways, um, that was a big takeaway from this hunt. I won't be running a canister stove for my winter hunts anymore. And I'll be mo moving to like a white gas, a liquid gas pump type system moving forward. So I camped close to the river because I didn't want to waste the gas melting snow for drinking water every day. Plus it takes a really long time. So I was maybe a hundred meters away from, from a flowing river. So it was perfect. So I woke up in the morning, walked down to the river, filled up my stuff. My, my breakfast routine is pretty set in stone. I make coffee and I have granola and protein, uh, like a little breakfast kind of cereal thing and pour water on it and yeah, eat it like cereal and have my cup of coffee. And basically I'll talk about my daily routine, but then the next six days in a row are essentially identical, right? Like I was in there for seven days in total. So I guess the five days in the middle were essentially identical. I'd wake up every morning, have breakfast. If the weather permitted, I would take my coffee, walk out to my glassing spot. I would glass. Basically where I camped was close to this big break in the river. And the first day I hiked out onto the river and it was like, there's only a couple spots where water isn't flowing. The rest of it's just all covered in snow and um, kind of big drift logs and stuff like that. So I hiked, you know, a couple hundred meters from camp way out into the, this middle of this kind of like, I guess what it, it would have been a gravel bar in the middle of summer. And from where I was, you could kind of see three main areas of interest, like three big faces that all not only had the potential of having goats on them, but I had personal knowledge of at some point there were goats on all three of these faces. So I felt very positive that I was in the right frame of mind. And let me talk about my strategy for this hunt as compared to other hunts. Normally I'm trying to cover as much ground and see as much new country as possible. And I think that's something that has not served me particularly well over the years. It feels good because you're covering ground and you are taking action. You feel productive. You feel busy. You feel like you're taking control of the situation. But the reality of the situation is I don't, I'm not sure that's always the most successful way to hunt as I'm not sure that's always the best strategy to have. So going into this hunt, I was like, I'm going to go to one area. I know for a fact there's goats in this area and I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to glass these three hills every single day, all day until I start finding some goats. So the first day, beautiful weather, cold as hell, but no snow, blue skies. It's great. I glass the hell out of all three hills and I see nothing all day. Now, it's too cold to literally glass all day. So I was kind of doing like these hour to two hour shifts where I would go out, glass the hell out of everything until basically it was my, my feet were the limiting factor. And it was oddly enough, it wasn't even so much my toes as it was the bottoms of my feet. Um, but I would glass until I, I, I just couldn't kind of take 
the kind of numbness or the pain in the bottom of my feet anymore. And then I would go back to camp, do what I needed to do in order to warm up my feet and then head back out. Now, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that as well, because one of the pieces of gear I brought with me on this hunt that I didn't bring on my last hunt is a pair of MEC synthetic booties. So these are like soft shell boots that you pull on over your feet, not over top of your other boots, but your, but just like your sock feet. And they've got a synthetic insulation in them, maybe like 120 grams or something of insulation in each booty. Like they're fairly well insulated. Uh, you can sleep in them, but they do have like felt soles and rubberized outers. So you can walk around in the snow with them. They're not waterproof or anything like that, but you can walk around, you can sleep in them. And I really think these things are a great tool to have on a winter hunt because basically after glassing for a couple of hours, I'd go back to camp. I would put these take my big boots off, my last Sportivas, put these booties on, and then I would either wrap my feet in one of my puffy jackets, or I would get my sleeping bag out of the tent and wrap my feet in the sleeping bag, slit like that for an hour. That would get the blood pumping back into my feet. Um, the feeling would come back into my toes and the soles of my feet, and then I could go back out and glass. So first day I do all that, I glass, I don't find anything. So pretty uneventful day. Now, day number two kind of rolls out the exact same way. Get up, have my breakfast, do my thing, go out, start glassing. And I don't remember what time it was, but um, on the one of the three faces, I do finally turn up a goat. And this is one of the things that I'm, I've been thinking a lot about is that like, why is it more successful to sit in one place and glass the exact same hills multiple days in a row versus trying to look at as many different hills as possible? And I think there's two possible explanations. Oh, and it could be a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Explanation one is that there's actually animals there, but they they might not be moving at all the first time you see them. And if animals aren't moving at all, they can be a lot harder to glass. Goats in winter aren't the hardest thing in the world to glass. They're yellow. They stick out against the white sun. Like once you see them, it's pretty hard to not see them. But that being said, there's a lot of broken terrain. There's a lot of rocks they can be behind. There's a lot of trees. There's just basically a lot of places they could be sitting where if you don't know they're there, even though they're technically visible, I don't know that you're going to actually see them because a lot, especially if you've been glassing for long periods of time, you kind of glaze over and you're, you're passing your glass over the terrain, but you're not actively intentionally glassing. So the one thing I think happens is I think there might be animals there, but you don't necessarily pick them up. And when you spend a couple days to look at the exact same spots, you kind of start to get to know the hills and you start to see like, oh yeah, like they, they, they take on the first time you glass a hill, it's like a 2D experience. It's like you're looking at a painting. It's flat. The more you glass that hill, the more 3D the hill becomes to you. You start to see like little nooks and crannies and little like areas and caverns that things could be hiding in. And it's almost like you start to get a bit more intimate with the hill. And then once you get to know the hill, that's when I found like things started to pop out at me. And it took a few days for me to get to know those hills and for me to really start seeing the goats everywhere. And so, like I say, were the goats there on the first day and I just didn't see them? Possibly. Or maybe there were no goats at all. Now, the second thing I want to note is that it's also possible that there's just no goats there. And the reason why it's beneficial to spend a couple days glassing the same hill is that you're essentially killing time until those goats or whatever animal you're of interest you're, you're looking for kind of crosses that hill. And I think from a statistical you know, calculation perspective, I think sitting in one spot and waiting for an animal to cross the hill you're looking at 
probably has a better statistical probability of you finding an animal than you randomly looking at as many hills as possible because you could almost be on the same movement pattern as the animals. And if you're not synced up appropriately, or if you just don't luckily cross paths with them, you could be like just one day ahead of them or one day behind them. And you could all, you could be moving in the same rhythmic pattern again and again. So, and at the end of the day, I don't think it matters. But what I will say is that this was the first time where I felt much more in control of the whole finding animal process. Like I picked the spot, I committed to myself to stay put and it paid off. So day two, I go out there and I glass and like, boom, I see a goat right away. Now this particular goat, I got very excited. It was, it wasn't terribly far away. Like it was close enough that I had a very good look at it. My glassing setup. I had a slick 634 tripod, a Tracer 4.5 LP pan head, Swaro ATX 85 millimeter spotting scope, and a pair of Swaro NL Pure 12 by 42 binoculars. So lots of glass. Like that's certainly, I had more than enough at my disposal. And it meant I could get a really good look at things. So I see this first goat, I get excited. It's looking pretty Billy-ish to me, you know, the, the longer I look at it, the one thing that was kind of concerning me, I'm like, the, the horns look rather spindly, like they look thin, but they were arcing outwards. They weren't parallel. They had a nice gradual sweep to the horn. They didn't have the big nanny kind of crook at the top, but the bases did seem a little far away and the horns looked a little spindly. And then the longer and longer I looked, I was like, oh, there's a bill, there's a kid. And then, and then it was like right with this, it was just kind of behind this shrub and it moved out. And the longer I looked at it, I was able to see these like little nubbin horns. And I was like, okay, that's a nanny. So I actually glassed that nanny with that kid every single day of the hunt, including the day that I hiked out. And if you look on my Instagram, I've got a video of that nanny. It's in the top frame of this kind of tri-frame video reel that I posted. And it's, she's huge. She's, you know, if it was solo, I wouldn't blame anybody for shooting that goat and thinking it was a Billy. But as soon as you see the kids, you just, you know, it's illegal to shoot a goat with kids in British Columbia. It's not illegal to shoot a nanny, but it is frowned upon. They ask you not to. So once I'd established that the, likelihood was it was a nanny. I was like, okay, that one's out. Now the, the, the frustrating part was this was one of the only goats I saw that was actually in a location I could access. Not only could I access getting a shot to that location, I could also access extracting the body if I was lucky enough to kill the goat. Um, so stared at it for a long time. That's another thing that I'm kind of not struggling with, but just chewing on is when you find an animal, it's so exciting to finally find one. You spend a lot of time just looking at it. And I was, I, I kept asking myself during the course of the hunt, like, is this really the best use of my time right now? Like, I know it's there. It's not going anywhere. I can't kill it. I, I'm probably better off looking at the rest of these mountains. But I also found I was learning a lot about the animal's behavior the more I spent glassing. So even though it might not be directly beneficial, I do think there are some indirect benefits to, to, you know, spending time glassing animals that you already know are there. So anyways, I turn that one up and, uh, find the kid. And, and sometimes it looks like there's two kids. Sometimes it looks like there's one kid. I can't really tell, but I know there's definitely kids. I know it's definitely a nanny. So I go back to my glass and, and then, Later on in that afternoon, I turn up what I still, I still think are three billies. Um, they were all adults. There were no kids. They were somewhat aggressive with each other at some point. Like the bigger one was chasing the other two around. Um, so yeah. So then I turn up a second group of three goats. I think they're billies. Now the issue with these goats is that they're really far up in the cliffs 
and they are in a location where I feel confident I could get to a spot to get a shot that would be like under three or 400 yards. But then given where they're perched, if they fall the wrong way, there is a very high probability that they're going to fall somewhere and I am going to be unable to retrieve the body. And so there was a couple of rules I set for myself before this hunt. One was you're not going to shoot a nanny if you under any circumstances, if you think it's a nanny, you're not going to shoot it. Cause like I said, it is legal to do it and people do do it from some, from time to time. And I'm not going to call those people's integrity into question. That's a, that's a decision everyone has to make for themselves. But I had decided under no circumstances, was I going to shoot a nanny on purpose? Now, if I made, you know, used everything at my disposal and I thought the animal was a Billy and I shot it and it turns out to be a nanny, so be it, you know, it wouldn't have been ideal, but I wouldn't, I, I committed to not intentionally shooting a nanny. I also committed to being very conservative about animal retrieval because I don't know if it's just lately or maybe because I'm so into goat hunting, I pay more attention to it. But I really see a lot of instances where like people are taking pot shots at goats and then when they can't go get them, they're like, oh, that's part of goat hunting. And it's kind of like, is it? I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that's maybe part of the way you choose to goat hunt, but you can always not take a shot. Like once you've taken a shot, there's no taking it back. And so I wanted to be relatively conservative about the areas I was willing to shoot a goat because I didn't want to not be able to retrieve a goat. So anyways, I find these three billies and they're way up at the top. Like I say, could have got up there possibly, but retrieving it could have been a very poor situation. Now, one thing I will notice, so that's day three. I spent another three days, I guess, glassing from this same location. And those three billies and the nanny and what turned out to be three more kids. So seven goats in all, and they were probably only six or 700 meters away from each other. But one was kind of like on the bottom corner of a hill. And the other one was like in a top corner of the same hill. Um, they literally lived on their little rocks that they were on for the four or five straight days that I glassed them. Like every day I would find them in the exact same location. Now, a couple points they did leave and come back. So whether they were like going for water or food, I don't know. I know they had food in both locations and it looked like they were licking water off of the rocks, like, like a little dripping kind of like seepage, but they could have also just been getting minerals off the rocks. I don't know. So a couple times they would like disappear for, three hours or half a day, but then they would pop right back up. And that was a big takeaway for me. Like I did not realize how little goats would move once they had everything they needed in the winter. Like if they got food, water and shelter, like they were committed to like this 10 meter diameter circle. Like it was wild. And they were there every day. I could glass them up every day. Something else I will note is that I do feel like if I had been with another experienced hunter, especially somebody who maybe was a little more comfortable with climbing than I was, I think we could have gone after those billies. I wasn't willing to do it solo, but I do feel, especially after the walk out, when I had an opportunity to look more closely at this area, I feel like... Um, I, I would have at least tried. We could have hiked up there. And if it turned out we had to turn around before taking a shot, that's fine. But I definitely would have wanted to at least try if I had somebody else with me. So that's a bit of a takeaway for me. I really love my solo hunts, but I think there's certain types of hunts where you're probably limiting your chances of success pretty drastically by going by yourself. And I think possibly winter goat hunting is, is one of those instances because of, you know, how difficult it can be to access and retrieve these particular animals. So that day comes and goes, nothing else changes. Next day literally comes and goes, nothing else changes. Maybe at this point I'll add in some 
takeaways from the hunt. Um, like I said, this is my third deep winter hunt now. And I started to implement some of the things that I'd wished I'd had from other hunts. For example, I took some hot chocolate packets so I could have a couple hot chocolate before bed every night. Um, that was huge. Like that was such like a bright spot in my day. Like I would look forward to it all day. It would help me sleep better at night. I think next time I would maybe mix it up with some apple cider packets. I think that would be really good. Like a hot apple cider before bed. Um, yeah, that was outstanding. That was just a real highlight of the, of the hunt for me. And then also what I did is I took these Lipton, not cup of soups, but like the little packets of chicken noodle soup. And the first day I just had it by itself. And then the second day I was like, oh, I brought elk pepperettes and I chopped up the smoked elk pepperettes and I put it into the chicken noodle soup. And that was hands down one of the single most delicious meals I've ever had in the back country. So then that became my midday break. Like I would work to glass all the way up till noon. And then I knew it was soup time and I would go back and I would boil the chicken noodle soup and I would throw in these smoked pepperettes. And it was just like a half a liter of nectar of the gods. Like it was, yeah. And I think the, re the reason I'm sharing this is a, I think those are two great tips and you can use those and take those things with you. But more importantly than that, I think on hunts like this, having these moments during the day that you can look forward to and that like bring some light and some joy into your life really helps the process. Because I want to say this may have been the most pleasant hunt I've ever been on in my life. And I'm not kidding. And everybody's going to be like, oh, it's minus 20. How's that even possible? Like, I cannot express to you how enjoyable this hunt was. I didn't film it. I didn't want to share it. I wanted to just have an experience to myself. I, I think I get too caught up in the content creation side of things. And I don't take time to remind myself to be present in the moment and remind myself like why I even like, why did I fall in love with hunting in the backcountry in the first place? It wasn't to start an Instagram account and put YouTube videos up. I didn't have either of those. Instagram didn't even really exist when I first started backcountry hunting. It was because of the peacefulness and the solitude and the isolation, like in this like beautiful calm that I would feel when no one else was around. And then I kind of forget that from time to time. So I didn't film it. I had this super, I knew, this is the first hunt I can remember where everything just went to plan. Okay, I didn't kill anything, but other than not killing anything, I literally scripted out the hunt before I left. I knew where I was going. I knew what I was gonna do. I knew where my water supply was. I knew what food I was taking. I knew where I was camping. Like, And then I did like every single thing that was in my plan, I executed. I was, there was no surprises. And part of this, I think, is I'm just getting better at this. Another part is, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I never go back to the same location twice. And I think having the benefit of going back to the same location twice, like it really makes me think about those people who have these honey holes that they just go to year after year after year. And I'm like, no shit, you're successful. Like it was so much easier than trying to find out a new area. And I'm not saying that... Um, to begrudge those people, I'm saying that like, yeah, no shit. Like I need to start doing more of that because clearly this is a better strategy. Like I need to mix up my hunts a little bit. So it was so peaceful. Like I enjoyed all of this hunt and it really, I'm going to, I'm starting to put in the plans now. I want to do like, not like a record setting solo hunt or anything, but I want to shoot for 21 days. I want to do 21 days solo somewhere. And the problem that I'm trying to solve is the food because realistically you can't solve, you can't carry more than 12 or 13 days worth of food on a hunt where you're going particularly deep and you're going to need a lot of gear. Um, you could do a food drop. You could hike in food beforehand. And I don't want to say like, I know it's silly, but it almost feels like cheating to me. Like, I feel like if you don't have everything on your back, when you go in there the first time, it's just a different experience. But then I was thinking, well, what if you got dropped off at a lake 
and you kind of hunted back and forth from the lake to other locations and you had the plane bring in a bunch of food when you originally came in, would that kind of meet my criteria for this hunt? Anyways, I don't want to get sidetracked too great, but there was a couple takeaways for this hunt. One, I am going to do at least one solo hunt every year that I do not film or generate a bunch of content from other than verbally, you know, sharing about it on the podcast, which I feel is like a very traditional form of oral storytelling. And it's something I would have done with a hunt a hundred years ago. So it doesn't feel like it's intruding upon the intimacy of the hunt. So every year I want a solo hunt unfilmed just for me, just for the piece. And then number two, I want to construct or plan or strategize some kind of like super epic, you know, solo over 21 day hunt at some point in the next, in the near future. I don't know exactly when it will be. Okay. So back to the point at hand, having these little things to brighten your day and to kind of like bridge the day because it does turn out to be somewhat monotonous, but saying, okay, I have my cup of coffee and my breakfast when I get up, which is one of my favorite meals. And then I'm like, okay, I got my soup at noon. So I'm really only feeling like 9 a.m. to noon. I got to go out and glass, do a bit of hiking, figure some stuff out. And then once you do that, you go, okay, I got supper at six and then I can have my hot chocolate at eight. And you're like kind of getting from moment to moment to moment. And you're never feeling overwhelmed by the whole process or you don't have this big monotonous day dragging out in front of you. And you have these highlights to kind of keep you encouraged and and uplifted. Okay. So day three comes and goes, nothing particular interest. Keep looking at the exact same two groups of goats. And then day four, same exact routine. I wake up, I do my thing and I'm glassing. And all of a sudden where I had been seeing the nanny and the single kid, All of a sudden I saw three goats and I saw what looked like two adults. Now to get closer to this area was about a mile and a half hike. I got instantly excited and I thought maybe the nanny and the kid had left. And I, what I, what I actually thought was that the nanny and kid had left and the group of three billies had moved from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill because I was like, where there was two goats, now there's three goats. That's all I knew. And I knew at least two of those goats looked like adult goats. And so I got super excited to the point where I didn't, when I went out to glass every day, I was putting very little in my backpack. I literally had a spotting scope, a glassing pad, my my tripod and my binoculars and maybe a little something to drink and a little something to eat. And then that was it. Um, and my big puffy jacket, my Kelvin down, uh, windstopper, like a, like a parka like jacket. Um, and so I didn't go back to camp. I didn't grab any extra gear. I literally just packed up everything in my, in my pack. And I started jogging essentially this mile and a half. And then on the way I, I stopped once to set up the glass, verified that yes, there's three goats. Yes. It looks like there's two adults still. Um, yes, this is still worth going after. I run all the way down there and essentially, I don't know if it was the distance. I don't know what it was, but basically it just turned out to be another kid. And I think the the size of that initial nanny also started playing tricks on me from way over where I was. And I was just kept saying like, that's got to be a Billy. It's got to be a Billy. And then when I saw the other animal with horns, I just thought for sure, there's got to be more animals over there that, or there must be, these must be different goats than what I first thought were there. So I, I ran all the way over there. Basically I get there. I set up the spotting scope. I get to a position where I could have taken a shot And I'm glassing, I'm glassing, glassing, and just turns out to be the exact same nanny, only now there's two kids. And so I don't know if my eyes were playing tricks on me that I saw more horns. I don't, I don't have an explanation. I sat there for half an hour. I glassed the hell out of them. 
I, I was able to see the other section of the hill. I confirmed the original three goats, or at least two of the three goats, the billies that I thought were billies up on the top of the hill were still there. And that's just, it, it just was kind of like a waste of a trip, but I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't have an explanation other than I really thought that there were different goats and I thought that I had an opportunity. So I packed everything back up and walked all the way back to camp and it was almost the end of the day by then. So this is day four, go to bed, wake back up. Now I'm on day five, starting to feel the pressure. You know, I really only have two full hunting days left, uh, after this. So go out, start glassing, don't see anything for the first half of the day. And then right around three o'clock, the thing that I've been waiting for the entire hunt happens. There was this hill behind camp that was the location that had it was the, it was the location that I had the highest hopes for, not because I had the highest hopes that there was going to be goats there, but I had the highest hopes that if there were goats there, I had the highest likelihood of killing and retrieving the goats because that hill had the best access. It had the most timber. The slope was the most reasonable. Like there was just everything about it was like, that's a prime location to kill a goat. And there hadn't been any goats the whole trip. And then day five, I glass up in one of these little timber windows. At least that's what I call them. So when you're glassing a hillside, you're going to have the exposed rock of the hill. This is where everybody, including myself, you spend the majority of the time glassing because you can see it. You expect to see animals on it, especially goats and sheep. It's got everything that you would want. And then when you hit the timber, either at the bottom or the sides, you either kind of turn your glass around and go back into the hill or you'll gaze kind of cursorily over the timbered section because your mind kind of looks at the timber like it's a wall of timber, like it's a flat, impenetrable surface and you can't see anything into it. But like I was talking about earlier with the intimacy of the hills and getting to know the hills better, the longer you glass these timbered areas, the longer you realize it's not impenetrable and it's not two-dimensional. And in fact, there's lots of like little breaks in the timber where you can see through to the ground behind. And then you see these little rocky ledges and you start like thinking there could be a goat in any one of these locations. So you start spending a lot more time really picking that timber apart. And then on day five, right in one of these little timber windows, bam, there's a billy. Now, he wasn't a huge billy. And I could tell based on the, how big the other three were that I've been glassing the whole time, but based on my estimation, he was by himself. He had the kind of X frame to his horns. They, they spread away at the top. They didn't have the nanny crook. They had a nice gentle sweep. I didn't see him take a piss or anything. So I can't, you know, say beyond a shadow of a doubt it was a Billy, but it really looked like a Billy. And at this point it's three o'clock in the afternoon and it's been getting dark at around five forty-five. If I had run up the hill I think I could have gotten to a spot to take a shot on him before dark. But then I started thinking, well, what am I going to do once it gets dark? I still got to get down this like cliff in the dark, which is a terrible idea. And then am I supposed to process a Billy up there and then bring him back down in the dark as well? I'm like, that doesn't seem very responsible. And then because of the behavior of these other two groups of goats. I mean, I've been looking at what is now six goats for three or four straight days. And they literally haven't moved 20 meters except for maybe to go get some water a couple of times. So I really thought like, I thought this through, I'm like, okay, the responsible thing to do here is just keep, keep glassing this guy for the rest of the day, put him to bed and then bright and early, wake up seven, seven 30, put glass on him, make sure he's still there and then run up the hill because then I would have all day to get into place, take a shot, retrieve the goat, get him down the whole nine yards. So I'm literally glassing and glassing and glassing. It's getting dark. It's getting dark. He's laid down. Nothing's happening. I'm like, this is going to happen. I can't believe it. And then maybe 
20 minutes before dark. Out of nowhere, for no reason, the goat just gets up and walks out of my life forever. And I was just like, I, ah, uh, and I didn't know it at the time. I was like, maybe he just went to get water. Maybe he just went to sleep somewhere else. The sun had kind of gone down. So I was like, maybe he can't sun himself anymore. But that was the last I ever saw of that goat. Now, and you instantly start to second guess yourself, but I've thought about this a lot and I stand by my decision. Not every decision is going to be the right decision, but I think I try and think about decisions in regards to probabilities. Like what types of principles and rules can I follow with my decision making that will lead me to making decisions that over the entirety of my life will produce the highest likelihood of success? And I think waiting for morning to go after that goat nine times out of 10 is the right thing to do. I think there's that 10th time when it's not the right thing to do, but you can't tell the future. So I stand behind my decision. I think I would, if I was in that exact same situation again, I would still do the exact same thing. Cause here's the other thing. I still don't know how long it would have taken me to get up that hill. And it's possible that it would have taken me just a little bit longer than he sat there to get up that hill. And by the time I got up there, he would have wandered off into the dark, into the edge of the timber already. So yeah, there's nothing I can really do about it, but that was day five. And I, you know, I looked for him and I, I, you know, all the next day I came back out, which was day six. It was my last full day, glassing and glassing and glassing, never turned him up again, never turned up another goat on that hill. But on that first initial hill, those other six goats, you know, it looked like it's back to a nanny and one kid now at the bottom, but still looking at them all day, all day, all day. Now, and if I was going to be, well, I'll, I'll, I'll finish off here. So day six comes and goes the last day, day seven is the last day of the season. And I want to take my time walking out thinking I'm better off instead of sitting here for the last day of the season. And then if I saw something walking out the following day, I wouldn't be able to take a shot because I would be past the season. I was like, I'm going to walk out on the last day of the season and take my time. And that way, if I see something, I can still legally shoot it. So day six comes and goes, nothing happens. Day seven, I wake up, I have my breakfast and I start to pack up camp get everything packed up and I start making my way out. Now, as I'm walking back out past this hill that has all these goats on it that I've been looking at the whole time, the nice thing about it is I was really, I don't know, it really confirmed for me that I was correct in my assumption that I, there's no way I would have been able to retrieve those goats from the upper section. I think if they had have tipped over backwards, but like goats are known for being able, like very, very tough to kill and getting up and walking significant distances after taking multiple shots. And so it was nice that as I was walking out, I, I felt comfortable that I'd made the right call. My only, my only other regret is that I feel like maybe I should have taken a hike up there only to kind of validate some things for myself. And maybe I would have seen something in the timber, but also because I was so low, any time that I wasn't at my glassing spot was a time when a goat that was in a killable location could have made itself known. And I wouldn't been there to see it yet again, more kind of evidence that like having somebody else in there with me would have proven very beneficial because we could have split up and, you know, you know, you take today and go hike and I'll sit in glass and then swap out the next day. Um, there was other areas in this area where I was hunting as well that you could have split up and, and covered more ground without sacrificing this, like sit on these three Hills all day, every day strategy. However, as I was hiking out yet again, this lower group of goats, and this was probably more wishful thinking than anything. But then all of a sudden, 
I'm getting very close to this lower group of goats and now there's four goats and I'm just like, oh, it has to be a different group of goats. And I get all the way over there. I'm going over there anyway. So it wasn't like it was any extra effort, but I, I put my pack down, I get my spotting scope up and I'm looking back at that. What is still this big nanny, but I'm thinking maybe now there's other adults there. Long story short, I glass the heck out of those goats again for the 400th time. And they really still just turned out to be, you know, the nanny and what turned out to be three kids. So this is the other thing that, you know, I looked at that hill for five straight days and I saw the nanny with at least one kid for four consecutive days. And until the last day, I never once saw all three kids. So this really tells me something about how, about the percentage of animals you're actually turning up that are on the hill. Because I guarantee those three kids were there the whole time. It's not like those kids are off on some other mountain or down at the bottom or up at the top. Like they are with that nanny at all times. But if I was seeing a nanny and one kid, that could have been a different kid every hour to who knows. And the other two might've been somewhere else. But the fact that I could glass them up for four days in a row and never see all four goats together really goes to show you that there's no way you are looking or seeing 100% of the animals that are on a hillside at any given time, you know, maybe 75 or 80 if you're very skilled. So that yet even more confirming evidence for the fact that especially with like a mount, mountain goat or a sheep, I think finding a good location and staying put is a more successful strategy than trying to cover as much ground as possible. So at that point, I pack up the rest of my gear and, you know, other than some brief glassing breaks, I, I hike the rest of the way out. And that was the conclusion of my 2023 winter goat hunting season. And I think I spent something like 20 days hunting goats in total this year, which I feel very grateful for, you know, to have such an understanding wife and to be in a position in my life where I can take that much time off work and, you know, all the other stuff that has to kind of come together in order to make that happen. I think I learned a ton about the gear that I need to kind of survive comfortably in those situations. I learned definitely a lot about myself. Um, I definitely feel more skilled when it comes to thinking, finding out where the goats are going to be and how to glass those goats. And I want to give, I don't want to call everybody out by name because I don't know how many people actually want me to, to reference them on the podcast. Cause sometimes people share stuff with you and they don't really, you know, they don't want it known that, cause then they're going to get bombarded by people if I share their names. But uh, there, there are four or five guys in particular who are all really experienced goat hunters. And I guarantee if you're in BC, you kind of know who most of these guys are already. But I'd spent extensive time texting and phoning with these guys between the two goat hunts. Um, really trying, like, I felt very disheartened after the first one. I was like, I really thought I should have done better than this. I thought I did my homework. I wasn't turning them up. And they all spent time with me in their own way. And they all had slightly different strategies that weren't too different, but they all sent pictures of where they tend to find goats. They all gave me a bunch of insights. And I really feel like that played a pivotal role in why I did so much better on the second half of the hunt. Like I felt like I just knew more about where I should be looking and where I should be spending my time and the type of strategy that I should be executing for the hunt. So I just want to say thank you to those guys because it meant a lot to me. Um, you know, people don't have to go out of their way and they don't have to share with you, you know, information with you. And sometimes the hunting community um, isn't the most warm, you know, um, but I, I've had very good interactions with a lot of people lately. So there you have it. Winter goat hunting 2023. Uh, no dead goat, but I feel like 
I feel very confident that in my next hunt or two, this is going to happen. Like, I don't feel like it's a matter of luck and chance. I feel like I have the tools now and I have the experience to be able to like put this all together. All right. That's all we got. As usual, if you could take some time and, and, um, engage with the platform in any way that you can like comment, share, subscribe. It is all greatly appreciated. And until next time, thanks for tuning in.